from this we may understand that virtue is a thing most delicately balanced, and that if neglected, it quickly turns into its opposite. Scripture seems to refer to this symbolically, saying, The land into which you go, so as to inherit it, is a land subject to change through the movement of the peoples. Ezra chapter 9 verse 11 For as soon as someone who has attained the state of virtue inclines towards its opposite, his virtue is thereby altered, being a land subject to change. So from the moment that harmful fantasies appear, we should deny them entry into our mind. We should not allow it to go down into Egypt, for from there it is led away into captivity by the Assyrians. Jeremiah chapter 42 verse 19 and chapter 43 verses 2 and 3. For when the mind descends into the darkness of impure thoughts, and that is what Egypt means, then the passions drag it forcibly and against its will into their service. This is why the lawgiver, symbolically commanding us to deny entry to sensual pleasure, told us to watch the head of the serpent, because it is watching our heel. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 Its aim is to bite our heel and so to poison us, whereas our aim, our aim is to crush every provocation to sensual pleasure, for when the provocation is crushed, sensuality has little power over us. Samson surely would not have been able to burn the Philistines' crops unless he had first turned the foxes' heads in opposite directions, tied their tails together, and put a burning torch between them. Judges chapter 15 verse 4 This means that we should learn to detect the attack of deceitful thoughts from pre premonitory signs and to watch their first beginnings, which they contrive to make attractive in appearance so as to attain their end. Then we can expose the wickedness of these thoughts by comparing their first beginnings with the final results. This is to tie the tails together and to set between them a torch, thus showing things up for what they are. To clarify what has been said, let us take two examples. Often the vice of unchastity has its first beginning in self-esteem. The gateway at the entrance appears attractive, but hidden behind it lies the destructive path that leads the mindless into the realm of death. Under the influence of self-esteem, a man may perhaps enter the priesthood or the life of monastic perfection. And because many come to help him to come and because many come to him for help, his self-esteem makes him think highly of himself thanks to what he says and does. So, by beguiling him with such thoughts, self-esteem draws him far away from the inner watchfulness that he should possess. Then it suggests to him that he should meet a woman of supposedly holy life, and so leads him to assent to an act of carnal lust, depriving his conscience of its intimate communion with God and plunging it into abject disgrace. To tie tail to tail, like Samson, let us reflect how this man's thought began and where it led him, and let us consider how he was punished for his self-esteem by falling, falling into a shameful act of unchastity. Then we shall see clearly the contrast between the beginning and the end, and the way they are linked together. To take a second example, the vice of gluttony can lead 
to that of unchastity, and this in turn can lead to the vice of dejection. For as soon as one who has been overcome by the vice of unchastity regains the inner regains the state of inner watchfulness, he is filled with despondency and dejection. When pursuing the spiritual way, therefore, we should not be influenced by the pleasures of eating or the allurements of sensuality, but should consider where they both end up. And when, and when we find that they lead to de dejection, we have tied tail to tail, and by showing things up for what they are, we have set the crops of the Philistines on fire with a burning torch. Since warfare against the passions requires such knowledge and experience, anyone who assumes the task of spiritual direction should realize how much he needs to know in order to lead those under his charge to the prize of the high calling, and to teach them clearly all that this warfare entails. He should not pretend to gain the victory by shadow boxing but must engage in a real battle with the enemy and inflict deadly wounds upon him. This struggle is far harder than any gymnastic contest. When an athlete's body is thrown to the ground, he can easily get up. But in the spiritual warfare, it is men's souls that fall, and then it is very difficult for them to rise once more. If a man, while still battling against the passions and stained with blood, tries to build a temple of God out of souls made in the divine image, he should listen to these words. You shall not build me a temple because you are a man of blood. To build a temple for God, one must be in a state of peace. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it outside the camp. Exodus chapter 33 verse 7. This shows that the teacher must be far removed from the tumult of war and the confusion of the camp and must have attained a peaceful and unwarlike state.